Good morning, Team Alabama. Please join me in reading on page 237 in The Hunger Games. A few steps into the woods grows a bank of wild flowers. Perhaps they are really weeds of some sort, but they have blossoms and beautiful shades of violet and yellow and white. I gather up an armful and come back to Rue's side, slowly one stem at a time. I decorate her body in the flowers, covering the ugly wounds, Re wreathing her face, weaving her hair with bright colors. They'll have to show it, or even if they choose to turn the cameras elsewhere at this moment, they'll have to bring them back when they collect the bodies and everyone will see her then and know I did it. I step back and take a last look at Rue. She could really be asleep in that meadow after all. Bye, Rue, I whisper. I press the three middle fingers of my left hand against my lips and hold them out in her direction and then I walk away without looking back. The birds fall silent. Somewhere a mockingjay gives the warning whistle that precedes the hovercraft. I don't know how it knows. It must hear things that humans can't. I pause, my eyes focused on what's ahead, not what's happening behind me. It doesn't take long, and then the general bird song begins again, and I know that she's gone. Another mockingjay, a young one, by the look of it, lands on a branch before me and bursts out Rue's melody. My song, The Hovercraft, were too unfamiliar for this novice to pick up, but it has mastered her handful of notes, the ones that mean she's safe, good and safe, I say, as I pass under the branch. We don't have to worry about her now, good and safe. I've no idea where to go. The brief sense of home I had that one night with Rue has vanished. My feet wander this way and that until sunset. I'm not afraid, not even watchful which makes me an easy target, except I'd kill anyone I met on sight without emotion or the slightest tremor in my hands. My hatred of the capital has not lessened my hatred of my competitors in the least, especially the careers. They at least can be made to pay for Rue's death. No one materializes though. There aren't many of us left and it's a big arena. Soon they'll be pulling out some other device to force us together, but there's been enough gore today. Perhaps we'll even get to sleep. I'm about to haul my packs into a tree to make camp when a silver parachute floats down and lands in front of me, a gift from a sponsor, but why now? I've been in fairly good shape with supplies and maybe Haymitch has noticed my despondency and is trying to cheer me up a bit, or could it be something to help my ear? I open the parachute and find a small loaf of bread, and it's not the fine white capital stuff. It's made of dark ration grains and shaped in a crescent sprinkled with seeds. I flash back to PETA's lesson on the various district breads in the training center. This bread came from District 11. I cautiously lift the still warm loaf. What must it have cost the people of District 11 who can't even feed themselves? How many would have had to do without a to scrape up a coin to put in the collection for this one loaf. It had been meant for Rue, surely, but instead of pulling the gift when she died, they'd authorized Haymitch to give it to me as a thank you, or because like me, they don't like to let debts go unpaid. For whatever reason, this is a first, a district gift to a tribute who's not your own. I lift my face and step into the last falling rays of sunlight. My thanks, to the people of District 11, I say, I want them to know that I know where it came from. That's the full value of their gift has been recognized. I climb dangerously high into a tree, not for safety, but to get as far away from today as I can. My sleeping bag is rolled neatly into Rue's pack. Tomorrow I'll sort through the supplies and tomorrow I'll make a new plan. But tonight all I can do is strap myself in and take tiny bites of the bread. It's good, it tastes of home. Soon, the seal's in the sky, the anthem plays in my right ear. I see the boy from District 1, Rue. That's all for tonight. Six of us left, I think. Only six. With the bread still locked in my hands, I fall asleep at once. Sometimes, when things are particularly bad, my brain will give me a happy dream. A visit with my father in the woods, an hour of sunlight, and cake with Prim. Tonight, it sends me Rue. Still decked in her flowers, perched in a high sea of trees, trying to reach me or teach me to talk to the mockingjays. I see no sign of her wounds, no blood, just a bright laughing, 
girl. This, she sings songs I've never heard in a clear melod melodic voice, melodic voice, on and on through the night. There's a drowsy in-between period when I can hear the last few strains of her music, although she's lost in the leaves, and when I fully awaken, I'm momentarily comforted. I try to hold on to the peaceful feeling of the dream, but it quickly slips away and leaving me sadder and lonelier than ever. Heaviness infuses my whole body as if there's liquid lead in my veins. I've lost the will to do the simplest tasks, to do anything but lie here, starting staring unblinkingly through the canopy of leaves. For several hours, I remain motionless as usual. It's the thought of Prim's anxious face as she watches me on the screen back home that breaks me from my lethargy. I give myself a series of simple commands to follow, like, now you have to sit up, Katniss. Now you have to drink water, Katniss. I act on the orders with slow robotic motions. Now you have to sort the packs, Katniss. Rue's pack holds my sleeping bag. Her nearly empty water skin, a handful of nuts and roots, a bit of rabbit, her extra socks, and her slingshot. The boy from District 1 has several knives, two spare spearheads, a flashlight, a small leather pouch, a first aid kit, a full bottle of water, and a pack of dried fruit. A pack of dried fruit out of all he might have chosen from? To me, this is a sign of extreme arrogance. Why bother to carry food when you have such a bounty back at camp? when you will kill your enemies so quickly that you'll be home before you're hungry. I can only hope the other careers traveled so lightly when it came to food and now find themselves with nothing. Speaking of which, my own supply is running low. I finish off the loaf from District 11 and the last of the rabbit. How quickly the food disappears. All I have left are roos, roots, and nuts, and the boys dried fruit and one strip of beef. Now you have to hunt, Katniss, I tell myself. I obediently consolidate the supplies I want I want into my pack. After I climb down the tree, I conceal the boys' knives and spearheads in a pile of rocks so that no one else can use them. I've lost my bearings with what with all the wandering around I did yesterday evening, but I try and head back in the general direction of the stream. I know that I'm on on course when I come across Rue's third unlit fire. Shortly thereafter, I discover a flock of grooselings perched in the trees and take out three before they know what hit them. I return to Rue's signal fire and start it up, not caring about the excessive smoke. Where are you, Cato? I think as I roast the birds and Rue's roots, I'm waiting right here. She's getting a little cocky, don't you think? Who knows where the careers are now? Either too far to reach me or too sure this is a trick, or is it possible too scared of me? They know that I have the bows and arrows, of course. Cato saw me take them from Glimmer's body. But have they put two and two together yet? I figured out I blew up the supplies and killed their fellow career. Possibly they think Thresh did this. Wouldn't he be more likely to revenge Rue's death than I would? being from the same district, not that he ever took any interest in her. And what about Foxface? Did she hang around to watch me blow up the supplies? No. When I caught her laughing in the ashes the next morning, it was as if someone had given her a lovely surprise. I doubt they think PETA has lit the signal fire. Cato's sure he's as good as dead. I find myself wishing that I could tell PETA about the flowers that I put on Rue, that I no, now understand what he was trying to say on the rooftop. Perhaps if he wins the games, he'll see me on Victor's nights when they replay the highlights of the games on the screen over the stage where we did our interviews. The winner sits in the place of honor on a platform surrounded by their support crew. But I told Rue I'd be here for both of us, and somehow that seems even more important than the vow that I gave Prim. I really think I stand a chance of doing it now, winning. It's not just having the arrows or outsmarting the careers a few times, although those things help. Something happened when I was holding Rue's hand, watching the life drain out of her. Now I am determined to avenge her to make her loss unforgettable. And I can only do that by winning and thereby making myself unforgettable. I overcook the birds, hoping someone will show up to shoot, but no one does. 
maybe the other tributes are out there beating one another you senseless which would be fine even ever since the bloodbath i've been featured on screens more than i care eventually i wrap up my food and i go back to the stream to replenish my water and gather some but the heaviness from the morning drapes back over me and even though it's only early evening i climb a tree and settle in for the night my brain begins to replay the events from yesterday and i keep seeing rue speared my arrow piercing the boy's neck i don't know why i should even care about the boy then i realize he was my first kill along with other statistics they report to help people place their bets every tribute has a list of kills i guess technically i got i get credited for glimmer and the girl from district four too for dumping that nest on her but the boy from district one was the first person i knew would die because of my actions numerous animals have lost their lives at my hands but only one human i hear gail saying how different can it be really amazingly similar in the execution a bow pulled an arrow shot entirely different in the aftermath i killed a boy whose name i don't even know somewhere his family is weeping for him his friends call for my blood maybe he had a girlfriend who really believed that he would come back but then I think of Rue's still body, and I'm able to banish the boy from my mind, at least for now. It's been an uneventful day, according to the sky. No deaths, and I wonder how long we'll get until the next catastrophe drives us back together. It is going to be tonight. I want to get some sleep first. I cover my good ear to block out the strains of the anthem but then i hear the trumpets and sit straight up in anticipation for the most part the only communication the tributes get from outside the arena in the nightly death toll but occasionally there will be trumpets followed by an announcement usually this will be a call to a feast when food is scarce the game makers will invite the players to a banquet somewhere known to all like the cornucopia as an inducement to gather and fight Sometimes there is a feast, and sometimes there's nothing but a loaf of stale bread for the tributes to compete for. I wouldn't go in for the food, but this could be an ideal time to take out a few competitors. Claudius Templesmith's voice booms down from overhead, congratulating the six of us who remain. But he is not inviting us to a feast. He's saying something very confusing. There's been a rule change in the games. A rule change? That in itself is mind-bending since we don't really have any rules to speak of except don't step off your circle for 60 seconds and the unspoken rule about not eating one another. Under the new rule, both tributes from the same district will be declared winners if they are the last two alive. Claudius pauses as if he knows we're not getting it and repeats the change again. The news sinks in two tributes can win this year if they're from the same district both can live both of us can live before i can stop myself i call out Peta's name okay go ahead and add to your facts today have a great rest of your day team alabama